Welcome to the Isle of Wight NHS Trust Health and Wellbeing event. My name is Anne Snow, consultant cancer nurse. This video has been created for cancer patients at the end of treatment, however is relevant to all cancer patients in relation to maintaining wellbeing. We have presentations from Andrew Savage, Level 4 Macmillan, Exercise Facilitator, Jennifer Van Zandt, Oncology Dietitian, Alison Gold, who is a Clinical Psychologist, Jennifer Molam, Colorectal Cancer CNS, and Joanne Buckley, Urology CNS. We hope you find this information beneficial for your future health, and as always, your clinical nurse specialist is available for ongoing advice and support. Hi everyone, um, my name is Andy Savage. I'm a level four chronic respiratory and level four cancer rehabilitation exercise specialist. And uh, I'm gonna sort of talk to you today about ways to keep active. Um, just an idea for everybody is that uh, we can all keep active, we're all meant to keep active in our own ways and uh, try and do as much exercise as, is, as we feel comfortable doing. Um, what I find myself is that if I can try and be active for about 30 minutes a day, that really sort of uh, helps uh, my, both with my motivation, it helps my physical health and it also helps my mental health. So uh, it's important for us to know that there are times when we can't exercise, we may have bad days, we may feel fatigued, maybe we've just had some treatment. And uh, so having a rest is also vitally important. So it's just worth taking a bit of time in your day and in your week to plan that when you feel good, you might want to get out and do a bit of exercise. Now that can be as simple as going for a walk. On a nice day, then there's nothing better than to go for a walk go to a local park, go down to the beach, um, go out and meet up with some friends and, uh, and drive, park the car and then have a nice walk somewhere. And there's studies show that you know, half an hour out in the fresh air does a wonderful things for us. It really lifts our mood, it helps our endorphins. Um, you know, it just is such a nice way to, uh, to enjoy the fresh air and, and the beauty that the Isle of Wight has. Um, some days, of course, you may not feel like going out, you may feel uncomfortable about going out. So in that time, then you need to look at things that you can actually do. Now, people get a bit scared when you mention the word gym and, uh, you know, there are plenty of other exercises you can do. You know, if you think of sports, if you think of things like dancing, you know, if you're listening to music and moving around, anything that gets you up out of a chair will actually uh, be prudent for exercise. It'll be good for you to exercise with. And then talking of chairs, I've got a couple of uh, willing volunteers here that uh, are going to help me uh, in this uh, little presentation for you. And uh, every day we get up and down, we get out of up and down out of a chair. And chair exercises do a lot for our health and well-being. They do a lot to work and give us some strength in our functional muscles, the quad muscles, at the in the legs. And, uh, and also our core strength. So it's good to practice things like uh, getting up and down out of a chair comfortably. And you can make this as hard or as easy as you want to. Best not to use a sofa, best use a comfortable chair. And, uh, and, uh, and if we just demonstrate that by sitting, going from a sitting position to a standing position, sitting back down again, and then just repeating that five or six times, and as you're doing that, just noticing how you might become a little bit breathless, you might become warm. So you might reach five and think, I just need to have a little rest. So after five, you might just want to pause, but equally, you might then want to carry on. So a simple exercise, just by getting up and down out of a chair, is going to really help strengthen our muscles. It's going to, it makes you feel good. If you feel warm when you're doing any form of exercise, you might get a bit out of breath, but getting out of breath is fine. Um, just knowing when that you need to stop. And we often say that by working in small bite-sized chunks, so setting yourself a little goal, if it's 10 sit to stand one day, maybe the next day that will increase to 12. Maybe the next day you may do 15. Then you might have a day where you just fill off colour, you might not want to do any exercise, have that as a rest day, and then see how you go. So just work something out for yourself. Now it's important that we can exercise the legs and there are plenty of other exercises that we can do um, and we have plenty of classes that uh, you can uh, come along to i run several classes around the island at various locations and your cancer nurse specialist can give you the details 
and, uh, and, and show you and you can come along and see what we do. Getting breathless is good, that's what we call aerobic exercise. Equally, doing some strength exercise where you're going to tone up muscles in the arms. So quite often, if we neglect exercising the legs or the arms, then the muscles can sort of waste away a little bit. And you've probably heard the phrase, use it or lose it. So again, my willing volunteers, they haven't, we haven't got a gym here. We've just got some water bottles there. And just by literally, um, and this, again, you can do this exercise seated or standing, it's whichever you prefer. But the idea is, is if you hold the water bottles like, uh, out like that, and then just curl them up and down. And you'll notice that again, after a while, just slowly and gently, not too fast, everything we do when you're doing anything for strength and, and, and using something that's weighted, that could be tins of soup or baked beans. Um, you don't have to buy um, expensive gym equipment in order to, uh, to exercise your arms and to build strength into them. So just doing several of those, and you might want to change the direction. If you actually turn your hands that way and hold the bottles, you can pull them up. And that way you've got an upright row. So you're then working a different set of muscles. In the first exercise, you're working the muscles here. Now you're working the muscles at the back there. So biceps and triceps are getting exercised by doing a bit of strength training. You'll know that if you go take things uh, off a shelf, you know, uh, moving around, carrying things, equally that will help. Where a lot of people find they get exercise from and strength exercise especially is out in the garden. So if you have a garden and you do a bit of gardening, we all know then how uh, muscles do tend to ache after a spell in the garden. Finally, another exercise that we should, the type of exercise we should uh, be conscious about is actually about how flexible we are in balancing. And as we get older, we tend to lose our balance. So it's good to test our balance from time to time. And my volunteers are now going to sort of stand by the chair. Um, and it's just basically a simple test and it's worth having something you can hold on to. So a back of a chair, the side of a chair, but just something like even just trying to lift one leg gently off the ground and holding that position, seeing how long you can balance on one leg for. And then swapping over <laughs> and doing the other one. Um, often you find that one side is better than the other, okay, but with practice it's very good. And there are other exercises in terms of balance that you can do. One is to try and walk as if you're walking down an imaginary line. So walking, pushing the heel and the, in front of the toes, walking along and walking back. So uh, there are types of uh, balance exercises that we can all do. Another one that we uh, get people to do in my exercise classes could be something like imagining that where you're standing around you there is a clock. And so to put one step forward is 12 o'clock. Bring your foot back, take your foot to the side, 3 o'clock. And then to the back is 6 o'clock. The other foot to the side is 9 o'clock, and then to the front again is 12 o'clock, and back to 6 o'clock. And then you can use, obviously, the other times as well, and you can involve it in a game, trying to go all round the clock numbers. So all these things help to test your balance. Think of other things in your home that you could use for exercise. Steps, a bottom stair, for example, just going up and down, a step up or that could be off of a back door step. Something where you might want to hold on to those. So up and down off of a step, do your step ups. In the kitchen, you've got a wonderful work surface there, so holding the worktop, just going up on your toes and down, helps to stretch our calf muscles. Equally, bending. <laughs> Don't get anything to hold on to here, but we can do squats. And again, you might hold on to that. And these are exercises that you can think about introducing into your daily life. It could be whilst you're waiting for the kettle to boil. Um, you know, I sometimes do it, find that I'm doing heel raises while I'm washing up. Cleaning my teeth, I might do a few knee bends. <laughs> so all these things are ways that you can incorporate more activity into your lifestyle. As we always say, our chair is lovely and a lovely place, and our sofas are lovely to sit on in the evening, but, um, you know, too much time on our sofa, we need to regularly get up and just gently move around throughout the day. So I hope in this short presentation it's given you an idea of some of the things that you can do to get out and about 
um, but equally indoors to help you move around, to just keep active and to work the muscles. And as I said, there's a lot of things it does for our mental health as well. So around the island, I do offer, as I say, exercise classes, move more exercise classes, go at your own pace. And also I offer um, a Tai Chi, which can be seated or standing, um, which is also a relaxation type class. Um, and the and details of these will be appearing at the end of the video, or as I say, you may um, ask your cancer nurse specialist for information and uh, they'll be able to give that to you. And thank you. Hello, my name is Jennifer Van Zandt. I'm the oncology dietitian here at St. Mary's Hospital. Um, as you know, what you eat is an important part of your treatment process and the recovery process. So generally speaking, um, people recovering from cancer should follow a normal, healthy diet. But depending on what treatment you've had, you may have more specific dietary needs. You might be confused on what to eat or what not to eat. You may need reassurance that you're eating the right things, especially with varying information that's available on the internet or that you've been given by well-meaning friends and family members. A normal diet consists of having three meals a day. Um, it's ensuring that you have adequate amounts of protein, fruits and vegetables, fiber, calcium, and fluids for hydration. While a normal diet is easy for some to achieve, others may need more specific dietary advice. You may need to regain weight or muscle mass. Uh, you may want to lose weight. You may have altered taste or dry mouth. You may have had a surgery that's left you with some unpleasant side effects. Regardless, we are here to help you in any way that we can with regards to your diet by providing you with advice on relieving any symptoms, adding calories and protein to your meals and snacks, or by providing advice on ways to modify what you eat and on your physical activity to safely achieve some weight loss following your treatment. If you feel like you would benefit from some dietary advice, please feel free to get in touch with the um, with myself at the dietetics department at the hospital or through your cancer nurse specialist or even through your GP. Alternatively, some really good websites to go to for dietary information and sound advice would be Macmillan, the World Cancer Research Fund and Bowel Cancer UK. Thank you for listening. Again, I'm Jennifer, the Oncology Dietitian, and I hope to hear from you soon. My name is Alison Gold. I'm a clinical psychologist working with the Oncology Service, and it's very nice to be able to talk to you today. I want to use this time to think about three things. The first of all being the feelings you might be experiencing at the moment. The second, looking at some ways of, of perhaps coping with those strategies. And then finally, we'll have a think about where you might be able to seek help if you need that, you needed that. And we know that having cancer treatment is a stressful thing psychologically and, and can have an impact on both you know, the person having the treatment and their family. And for that reason, there's a psychology service that's available to people who've been through treatment. Uh, I imagine you're watching this because you've come to the end of treatment. I want to particularly think about the feelings and the experiences that you might be having at the moment so a lot of people get to the end of treatment and they think you know, they're going to feel fantastic. You know, they've had a date in mind, they think they're going to get to that date and suddenly everything's going to go back to normal and they're going to feel wonderful. You know, the reality of it is that you know, people feel all sorts of feelings at that point. Um, if you ask me, the most common thing people say to me when I ask them how they are, they say up and down. And I think that sums it up really nicely that you might be feeling happy, elated, delighted, sad, anxious, worried, all of those things, and you might feel quite a few of them in the course of a day. So you know, it can feel a bit like a roller coaster experience. And all of those feelings are absolutely normal to be feeling, that's the most important thing to say. Why at the end of treatment? Well, I, I guess there are a few reasons that I think you, you, know, you might feel all these confusing emotions at this time. People have 
a journey set out in front of them when they start their treatment. And you know, a lot of time and energy is put into getting through that journey. It takes a lot of effort. And it's often only at the end of it that people suddenly think about what's happened to them and the implications of what they've been going through. Also, at the end of treatment, you might have less contact with the, the people that have been supporting you. And you know, it may be really hard to know what's going to happen next, especially perhaps if you're having maintenance treatment and you haven't actually got to the end of, of all the treatment that you'll have. So it could be a really confusing time and one way you're really having to think about you know, how, how normal life is going to look from, from this point onwards. So the really, really common worries that people have at this time that um, I'm sure you know, many of you will identify, I guess you know, a lot of people will, will be still thinking about what happens next, you know, what, 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 where will things go from now, how will they be followed up from, from this point onwards. And particularly, there's always a worry for people in the background about whether the cancer is going to come back at some point, whether um, you know, the treatment's been completed and, and you know, things can move forward or, or whether they still have to be worrying into the future. Uh, it's also really hard for people sometimes to know how to feel. They feel that they should be feeling positive and, and hopeful about the future, but sometimes that, that's very, very difficult. So I want to talk to you a little bit about how you might cope with all these feelings because they, they can be really confusing and um, quite distressing for people. And I just want to talk to you about three sort of areas that you might want to think about. So the first one is just accepting how you feel. I, people come to see me and very often they talk about they should feel like this or they ought to feel like that or they feel guilty that they're feeling low or, or, or you know, struggling in some way and I think people feel that you know getting to the end of treatment means that you know you should should be feeling great. The reality is much more complicated than that and fighting those feelings makes it harder so I would really encourage you to, to, to notice what you're thinking let those thoughts be there and not try to fight them particularly, you know, all those shifts and alls that you might find yourself saying to yourself, try and notice when you're doing them, because that's actually you beating yourself up about how you feel, and actually you've got nothing to beat yourself up about at all. So living with and accepting those feelings is a really, really powerful way of, of, of moving on with them. The next thing I would suggest is quite helpful to do is to think about what triggers you feeling worried or anxious or low in your mood. Now, you know, we know there are lots of really common triggers for things. You know, people talk about having scanxiety, you know, facing all sorts of worries when they're due to have checkups or scans. But there are other things that can trigger distress and, and, and uncomfortable feelings too. So some of those include anniversaries so of particular, you know, investigations or diagnosis. It could relate to seeing things in the media, um, there are an awful lot of adverts around on the television for cancer charities, for example, that can really come along and catch you by surprise. All of those things can trigger, trigger you know, these difficult emotions. And so just watch out for what triggers you feeling distressed or upset and what impact it has on you and think about how you might want to manage those things. So the third thing I would also suggest thinking about is support. Now people again often talk about the, the, the idea that once they're through treatment actually they shouldn't need any support anymore, that you know, their, their treatment's over and, and you know, people sometimes actually stop asking how they are, not realising actually they're often going through quite a difficult time still dealing with the aftermath of their treatment. So don't be afraid to ask for help, you know, tell friends and family how you're feeling. Let them know that although you're really pleased to have finished your treatment, that you may still be feeling quite vulnerable and struggling along physically and, and emotionally. I know we're going to talk also about the physical side of, side of and the aftermath of treatment as well. But emotionally too, you know, it can be quite a demanding time. But also don't forget that there, there are sources of help and support. You might not see them quite as often now, but you know, do talk to your healthcare team and ask for their advice and support if you're feeling that you're struggling with things. The fourth 
thing is just to think about how you look after yourself. So being kind to yourself. And sometimes people think that, you know, you get to the end of treatment and you're going to bounce straight back to normal life. Actually, for most people, the truth is something a little bit different to that. And there's a need to look after yourself both physically and emotionally to, to recover from the treatment. So that might involve all sorts of things, perhaps you're going to um, find yourself new ways of, of de-stressing. I often talk to people about learning relaxation or doing mindfulness and at the end of, of this um, talk I'll highlight some resources that might help you do that. But it also might just involve finding things that you really enjoy doing and getting back to doing them because sometimes those things stop while you're having treatment. And just being kind to yourself, not pushing yourself too, too hard or forcing yourself to do things before you're ready. And then the final thing I would say is control the controllable. So, you know, a lot is uncertain, isn't it, when you get to the end of treatment. You don't know quite where things are going to go. So focus on the things that you do know about. Don't compare yourself to other people. Um, don't, don't, don't be wondering about how their treatment is the same or different to yours. Focus on what you do know and focus on the things that you can control um, and try and keep active and get yourself in, in, out and enjoying things again. It's important to say you won't always get rid of worries. You know, they're, they're likely to be there for a while and you know, it's a process of adjustment coming to terms with everything that you've been through. Um, but focus on what's certain and you know, try not to fight how you're feeling, you know, going back to those shoulds and oughts again. If you find yourself saying those to yourself, stop yourself and think about you know, what you're really saying. And think about how you've coped before with difficult situations. We've all had them in our lives and think about you know, how you've been able to deal with difficult things before. It's all right to sometimes not be all right. One of my patients often says to me, you know, the thing I've learned is it's okay not to be okay. And the, 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 one of the most helpful things is to just make space for feelings to come and go. There's no right or wrong in how you feel. Um, and if you do find that you're, you're feeling low, try and encourage yourself. Treat yourself like you would a good friend and think what you might say to somebody you care about if they're in the same situation. Or indeed say to yourself, notice when you're doing well or when you've achieved something that you wanted to achieve. Finally, I just want to talk about you know, doing things that you enjoy. You know, it's easy while you're going through treatment that you almost become the illness, but you're not the illness. You're much more than that. Um, and you know, I want you to think about what's important to you. What is it that you want to get back to doing? Perhaps also what are the things that you haven't been doing that, that you would like to? And what are the new challenges that you might want to take on. Sometimes people find that, that you know, cancer treatment really changes their outlook on the world. And you, know, you might need time just to think about you know, your, your life and your goals and, and where they lead from here on in. So most of the time, these feelings, you know, they're confusing, they change quickly, they come and go, um, and they don't get stuck. But the time I would say to you to, to notice is if you find that you are stuck, feeling anxious, low, sad, any of those things for a pro prolonged period of time. Normally I'd say for two weeks, you know, if you consistently wake up every morning and you feel like there's a big black cloud over your head or you feel very anxious, that's the time to start thinking about getting some help. So first thing, talk to somebody about it, talk to your friends, your family, and, and you know, perhaps talk to your, your medical team who've been supporting you about how you feel. Um, and there are various sources of, of um, support for you that are available, um, which I'll detail at the end of, of this talk. First of all, you, know, there is, you can refer yourself to um, the primary mental health care services and I'll give you the number for that if you felt you wanted to do that. You can talk to your GP, or if you feel that you'd like to access the clinical psychology service, um, uh, one of the CNSs that we've been seeing will be able to, to make a referral, so talk to them if you feel that you'd like to, to go down that route. Thank you to, for listening to all of this. It is um, a lot of material to cover very quickly. Um, and I've also just created a few resources for you that will guide you towards um, 
sources of help in, in relation to the things we've talked about. And in and particularly, I'd direct you to a very, very good talk, which is online um, by a psychologist looking at treatment after, uh, anxiety after treatment, which covers a lot of the things that I've talked to you in much more detail. And I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that you have the, the, the contact details for that. Um, thank you for listening and good luck with your ongoing journey. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm one of the cancer nurse specialists here at St Mary's and I'm going to talk about the long-term side effects of chemotherapy. Firstly, probably the most commonly reported and universal side effect of um, chemotherapy is fatigue. Fatigue can be really debilitating and really impact the quality of life. Um, so it's important that we use multiple methods to help try and manage that. Exercise research has shown to be a really effective way of helping manage fatigue. We don't ask that you all suddenly take up marathon training or go in and lifting heavy weights at the gym. It's just exercise can be tailored to suit the individual. One study shown that a group of chemotherapy patients who did 20 to 30 minutes of moderate intensity walking for about three to five days a week really showed some improvement in their fatigue compared to a group of chemotherapy patients that did no exercise. Another method that can be helpful with fatigue is distraction and that's things like reading, playing games, listening to music or even socialising really can help. If you nap, Try and limit that to 20 to 30 minutes a day if possible, because we know if you rest and rest, that really can actually make the fatigue worse rather than better. Another method that has been shown to be beneficial to some patients is keeping a diary, where you log when your energy is good and when it is low, because if you have, it, it helps form a pattern. And if you can see in the time of day when your energy is better, if you've got a strenuous activity coming up, you can schedule it to fit when you're better to deal with it. And it's important to sort of use a combination of all those methods to help manage your fatigue. Another side effect that we know is something called, that we call chemo brain. Now we don't fully understand the cause for this. It presents itself with symptoms like memory loss, difficulty with concentration. Um, patients often describe talking and they lose their trail of thought midway through, or they have difficulty with word recall. They quite often describe it like a vagueness. Now again, research has shown exercise can be beneficial with that. Um, the activities to keep the mind active, such as doing crosswords or puzzles, can also help. But in balance with that, it's also important not to let yourself get too tired. If your brain's tired, it's harder for it to function, so if you need to rest, please do rest. Another common side effect that we see is something called peripheral neuropathy. It's more prevalent in certain chemos rather than all. It's a it presents itself as a sensation as like a pins and needles, sometimes combined with a numbness. It, it affects the hands and feet. It can be limited to the tips of the fingers and the toes, but depending on how badly the nerves have been damaged by the chemo, it can track up the hand and up the foot. And in some severe cases, I have seen it travel up to the back of the knee. Now, that can obviously impact day-to-day -day activities like holding a pen or picking up items, buttoning a shirt. It can be quite difficult. If your feet are affected, quite often patients describe it like walking on cotton wool. They can't quite feel the floor beneath them. So you may find you have balance difficulties or trip up more easily than before or, or may find your feet shuffle. Now, unfortunately, there's no medication to help this side effect. It's actually time is what we advise. And I'm talking months at least to see some improvement. But even with that time, you may see a degree of improvement, but for some, if the nerves are quite badly damaged, this may not improve completely, and it may mean having to adjust to a new normal. Some research has shown that exercise, again, can be beneficial with helping that. Um, further research as well has been done into holistic therapies, like um, acupuncture has shown some promising results, reflexology and massage, but there is still further research need to be done into that to really show some significant response. Some chemotherapies can cause changes to the way your heart works. Now, quite often we see this early on, but sometimes these symptoms can present later down the line. They may present as a, an increasing shortness of breath or fatigue or even swelling of the feet and ankles. If you're worried or concerned about this side effect, it would be worth contacting your nurse specialist just to clarify if this is something related to the treatment you received, because we see it with some treatments, but not all. 
And like, likewise, we also see that with the lungs. Certain chemotherapies can cause scarring to the lungs. It's more associated with more specific treatments, um, like something called bleomycin. Um, and basically that can present symptoms like a shortness of breath on exertion, um, more shallow breathing, and it, it, sometimes a cough. Um, if you are worried about these symptoms though, just to clarify it is the chemotherapy that's causing that and not something else, it would always be worth contacting your nurse specialist to, to talk it through in more detail. Sometimes people have radiotherapy with chemotherapy and if the radiotherapy was given to the chest area then we would, offer, again that could be a cause for those symptoms but my colleague will talk about that in more detail with regards to radiotherapy. We can sometimes um, see damage to hearing with chemotherapy. Again, it's certain chemotherapies, not all. Um, it can present itself in a, a way that you get like a ringing in the ears, which we call a tinnitus or actual hearing loss. Again, if you have concerns, you're noticing problems with your ears, please contact your nurse specialist and if necessary, we can refer you on to audiology for further support with that. Another long-term side effect we see with chemotherapy is changes to hormones. So for women, it would trigger the menopause. This can be more severe in symptoms because you're dropping down from a higher level of hormone down because of the chemotherapy being administered. So it can present with symptoms of hot flashes, mood swings, changes in sexual desire, and possibly some bone changes which you call osteoporosis. The oncologist may have given you some hormone replacement therapy to help manage with that. Likewise with men, we can sometimes see hormone changes. This is more predominant in hormone therapy rather than chemotherapy. Um, it can present in similar symptoms of hot flashes, osteoporosis and changes in libido. Again, if you have any concerns regarding this, um, again, please don't hesitate to contact your nurse specialists to talk through for further support. On mentioning osteoporosis, that's another long-term side effect that we see. Um, it can present with sort of aches and pains in the joints that you didn't have before. Um, exercise can be really helpful with that in strengthening the muscles to help support the bones. Um, it, it, it may present later down the line. It's sometimes picked up for other reasons like from blood tests and things. But um, by exercising that should help. Eating a healthy diet can also be beneficial. And if you smoke or drink, there are risk factors for osteoporosis. So by trying to cut down or even better stopping completely that's not only going to reduce your risk of osteoporosis it's going to help your health in general anyway. Another side effect that we know about is infertility hopefully this would have been discussed with you at the beginning before starting treatment um, because as we know for women it will trigger the menopause uh, by stopping your ovaries from working. For younger women this may come back you may find that your ovaries do start to work again but the chances of this happening is quite low and if it does it would be sometime later down the line for, for men it's it will stop the sperm production again if after a length of time after finishing treatment this may return but there's no guarantee the next side effect i'm going to mention is a low risk side effect but you may well have seen it in the literature you were given when you were um, consented for your drug and that is the chance of getting a second cancer. Now we see it only in certain treatments, it is a low risk, it is some significant years down the line but if you have any concerns about this please do not hesitate to contact your nurse specialist just to talk through in more detail and, and hopefully give you some reassurance about that. Finally, the last side effect I'm going to mention is psychological well-being. Now I know this is covered in more detail by my colleague but it's just to say you've faced chemotherapy, you've, you've experienced its side effects and the risks associated with it. It can bring on fear, anxiety, you could have experienced low mood or even depression. And although the treatment has stopped and finished, these symptoms don't go away overnight, unfortunately. So if you're struggling, please reach out to whether it be a family member, a friend, a neighbour, just talk to someone, but if you need further support, please contact your nurse specialist and if need be, we can refer you on for psychological support. And on the note of talking, all the side effects I've just mentioned to you are completely invisible. So even your loved ones around you may not realise that you're struggling if you don't tell them. And sometimes by telling someone how you're feeling, that makes them aware and with awareness, can come understanding and with understanding there can be support so please do reach out don't suffer in silence thank you for listening my name is
Jo and I'm one of the urology cancer nurse specialists here at St Mary's Hospital and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about radiotherapy and the possible side effects. So there are several different types of radiotherapy. Um, the majority of patients will have what we call external beam radiotherapy. So that is where we use a machine to target high energy x-ray um, waves at a specific area in the body um, from the outside or there is also internal radiotherapy, which is where we use um, either applicators or seeds um, which are inserted inside the body and gradually release radiation from inside. There is also radioisotope therapy, which uses liquid radiation, which is usually injected um, into the body. So your treatment would have probably been given at a major cancer treatment centre on the mainland. Um, and it can be given independently um, in it, as a treatment in its own right, but it can also be given alongside um, either surgery or chemotherapy. So normally radiotherapy is given in um, short daily sessions called a fraction, um, and these fractions can, um, the amount that you'll have will vary um, depending on where your cancer is. So it can be anything from a couple of weeks um, up to, to eight weeks. Um, and the reason your treatment is given in short, small doses is to allow um, your normal healthy tissues um, a chance to recover. Um, but what the radiation will be doing will be um, breaking down the DNA or the building blocks of your cancer cells um, to kill them off and destroy them. Your oncologist will have planned your, your radiotherapy um, in, in, in great detail um, and this is to try and minimise any um, side effects that you will get. However, the majority of um, patients will experience some short-term side effects. Um, this doesn't usually happen at the beginning of your radiotherapy treatment. It tends to happen towards the end or even once the radiotherapy has been completed. Um, and some patients will also go on to experience some long-term side effects. So no two patients will experience the same side effects. Um, and this will very much depend on the area of the body that you've had treated. So for example, if you've had radiotherapy to the bladder, your side effects will be very different if you've had radiotherapy to your lungs. However, there are some general side effects that the majority of patients will experience, and I'm gonna discuss these a little bit now. One of the most common side effects that the majority of patients will experience is tiredness or fatigue, um, and this can be quite debilitating. Um, so we recommend that you try and get a good night's sleep every night um, and resting if you need to. However, we also recommend that you don't rest too much or that will um, inhibit your, your ability to sleep properly at night time. Um, research has also shown that trying to do some gentle exercise will help boost your energy levels. Um, and Andy, my colleague, will have talked about this in more detail. Um, we also recommend eating a healthy, balanced diet um, and keeping well hydrated. So try and drink plenty of fluids, so water, squash, um, so up to two litres a day. Um, to, to, to try and help boost your energy levels. Um, we also recommending um, manage your activities so don't do too much in one day um, and ask your family or friends um, to help you if necessary. Um, another common side effect is um, possible skin reactions. So this is again caused by um, the radiation itself and your skin can often um, harden, become red, sore um, or even itchy. Um, so there's several things that we can recommend you do to help with this. So one of them is to wear um, loose fitting, comfortable clothing made with um, natural fibres if possible, such as cotton, so that it doesn't, st doesn't stick to your skin. We also recommend um, using unperfumed um, soaps and water. Um, and if you're going to use moisturiser, just use a simple emollient such as um, E45 or Diprobase. Um, also, when washing, try not to use extreme temperatures, so really hot or cold temperatures, use lukewarm water instead. And when you're drying yourself, rather than rubbing with a towel, just pat, gently pat the area to avoid, to avoid irritating it. Um, we also recommend staying out of extreme um, temperatures because wind and the sun can irritate the skin. Um, so either wear protection or wear sunscreen um, and you'll actually need to do that up to a year after your treatment and we recommend wearing a minimum of SPF 30 on your skin. Um, another possible side effect is nausea. Um, this is particularly um, prominent for patients having radiotherapy to their, their abdomen or their chest area um, and there are 
medications that we can give you to help with this, so we recommend you speaking to one of your cancer nurse specialists or your oncologist. Um, you might also experience difficulty um, eating and drinking, um, so there's several things that you can do to help this. This might either be to um, physical problems, difficulty swallowing, or just general loss of appetite. Um, so some patients will find it easier to snack frequently through the day rather than eating three large meals. Um, some people as well find the smell puts them off when they're cooking food, so if you've got someone that could cook the meal for you, that might be helpful as, as well. Um, some patients find ginger or mint really helpful, so having a cup of ginger tea or um, a mint tea might be helpful. Um, as well, if you're finding swallowing difficult, sipping water slowly through a straw is supposed to be really helpful. Um, but if you're still finding um, difficulty or you're losing weight, then again, it's better to speak to your cancer nurse specialist and she could do um, a referral to our, dish, um, our dietitian for additional support. Um, so there are lots of other possible side effects um, that are much more site specific. And again, we recommend that you speak to your cancer nurse specialist about these. Um, so another possible side effect um, is loose bowels or diarrhoea. And again, this is something that is easily treatable with medication. Um, so you can speak to your oncologist or your cancer nurse specialist. Um, and we can also give you specific um, dietary advice because sometimes cutting out high fibre and things while you're experiencing the diarrhoea can be helpful. Thank you for listening. Um, and as, as I said, um, please contact us if you have any further questions.